This week we read in the reading of Ekev, that's the name of the portion. And if you will listen or heed, Esa Mishpotim. Mishpot means rational laws. You will heed the rational laws, Ushmartem Vasismosim, and you retain them and you will actualize them. You will do them. If you do that, the Shomer Hashem God will uphold the covenant, the Sachesed, and the kindness of Shinish Beloved which He promised to your forefathers. Now, what is the meaning of the word Akev, the second word in the portion? And if you will heed Mishpoti, you will heed the rational laws of the Torah. And then it continues the next verse. God will love you, he will bless you, he'll increase you, he'll bless the fruits of your womb, press, bless the fruits of your herds and your flocks, the produce, everything will be blessed to the ultimate level. If you heed my rational laws, not my statutes, rational laws. So firstly, the word Ekev and Im in Hebrew mean the same thing. And if, so if the word Ekev means Im, the Torah always uses the word Im, if, if you shall. So why does he use the term, the word Ekev? Now in Hebrew, the word Ekev means heal. Why was Yaakov called Yaakov? Why was he named Yaakov? Yaakov was a twin. He was the twin brother of, of Esau. As his mother gave birth, Esau is the first one to open the womb of the mother, to come out first. And the Torah tells us, Yaakov, Oches, Bakev, Esau. Yaakov was holding on to the heel of his brother, Esau. And because he was holding on to his heel, that's the reason why he was named Yaakov. The word Akev is the word Yaakov. That's why he's named Yaakov, because he's holding on to his heel. Now, what does this first statement have to do with the heel? So Rashi himself cites the Midrash that if you, in Akev Tishmun, if you heed the Akev, what does that mean? In a mitzvos hakalos, shodom dosh bakevov. If you even observe the seeming light, seemingly unimportant mitzvos, which a person normally tramples on with his heel, meaning the neglected mitzvos. If you observe them, Hashem will uphold the covenant, the kindness, the blessings, you merit the ultimate. If you even at pay attention to what other people don't pay attention to, even to the seemingly unimportant mitzvos, which other people abuse, abuse due to neglect. How do we understand this? Why is it because you favor the underdog? The mitzvah that's neglected is like the underdog. And because you're paying attention to the underdog, God says, therefore, you're a special person. Or is, or is it much more than that? How do we understand it? We know that there are many commandments in the Torah. Many dictates of God with positive commandments, negative commandments. And the various commandments have various levels of obligation and various ramifications and consequences. For instance, if one violates the Shabbos, it carries a very serious liability. You, vi you violate the festival, the Yom Tif, it doesn't carry that same liability. If one doesn't say the Shema, one did not fulfill a positive commandment. The tshuva process, to repent on a positive commandment, which one doesn't fulfill, which is passively, the level of atonement comes about much quicker. A negative command, much more difficult to be atoned, to be reinstated. And if it carries the liability of spiritual excision or death penalty, it's even more severe. So we find more severe mitzvos, less severe mitzvos. That's the mitzvah kala, mitzvah hamura. 
Hamura is the one that is seemingly the more severe mitzvah. The mitzvah kalo is the less severe mitzvah. Which mitzvahs do people neglect and they trample on with their heels? The seemingly less important mitzvahs. It's less important. Now, when a person gets involved in a project in the physical sense, and the person says, you want to make this investment or you want to assume this level of responsibility and the person says, so tell me, what is my return on that investment on, on my involvement? So he says, you know, you get a fraction of a percent return. Person, you know something? It's not worth my while. It's not worth my while to put my money in at risk and it's not worth my time even to think about it. Therefore, I'm not interested. You pass on it. But something which has a greater guarantee and a greater guarantee return, the upside is great. Downside is minimal. The effort may be great, but it's worth the effort in terms of the return. So everything is evaluated based on, is it worth it? Is it worth the sacrifice? Is it worth the investment? Is it worth the focus? And it's a decision we make continuously. Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? And based on that evaluation, we either go for it or we pass on it. In the spiritual realm, observance of Shabbos is monumental for many reasons. It's, an, it's a test of God's the creator of the world. If you observe the Shabbos, God created the world in six days. And the seventh day, he refrained from creation. We being his chosen people, we're the testament of the world. He's the creator. The one violates the Shabbos, it carries a very serious liability. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, very important day. We fast. It's the most important day of the year in terms of reinstatement. You do it the day right for 25 hours, you're on top of the mount. You're able to be reinstated. Another day, doesn't have the same importance. Therefore, we're more meticulous and more focused on one day. The other day, we're distracted. So based on our evaluation, that's the way we determine what is the degree of involvement. Are we fully involved, partially involved, not involved whatsoever? That's called the human yardstick. That's our yardstick. Now, the question is this. If you use your human yardstick, is it worth it, not worth it? Now, so if that is the question, why are you doing the mitzvah? We read in Pirkei Avos, you should serve the master, not for the sake of reward, but you should serve the master not for the sake only, not for reward, but even without reward. The impetus should not be for the sake of reward. Serve the master not for the sake of reward. What does that mean? Don't do it for self-interest. Do it because he commanded you. The master commands you, you do it because it's God's will. Don't do it for the sake of reward. Because that minimizes the value of what you're doing. You may be doing the right thing, but it's not with the right intention. So let's understand something. The various levels of obligation, of dictates. Some carry greater liability, some have less liability, some have greater value, some have lesser value. The moment we take out our yardstick to be able to make that evaluation, what does that say? Is it worth my while? Is it not worth my while? You're not doing it for the right reason. Because if you're doing it because God commanded you, there's no difference between the lesser mitzvah and the more advanced mitzvah. It's all the same. As God wants you to observe Yom Kippur, God wants you to save the Shema. As God wants you to observe the Shabbos, God wants you to eat matzah to save it. It's all the same. Every one of them is God's dictate. So if that's the case, how do you pick and choose? The moment you start picking and choosing and using that yardstick, it tells, it speaks volumes. What is the impetus? The impetus is you, not God. 
So if you do it for you, you don't merit that blessing. But if you even address mitzvahs which are neglected by others, and you don't neglect those mitzvahs, those mitzvahs literally are trampled on people's heels, and you don't, why don't you? Because it has nothing to do with my gain, but rather understanding why I'm supposed to do it. It's because it's God's will. And me being a Jew, I'm bound to God's will. So therefore, it's irrelevant how advanced it is or how minor it is. If God wants you to do it, it's all the same. So if you, the reason why you're doing it because God wants you to do it, God says, I will uphold the covenant. I will give do the chesed. I will give you, I will bless the womb, the fruit of your womb, the fruit, the fruit of your herds and flocks, and the bounty will come un, unceasingly. Because you're not doing it for you, you're doing it for God. You're doing it for God's sake, not for yourself, not with the self-interest. That's the understanding. If you even address the mitzvahs that other people neglect and you pay attention to them, then you're at another level. And being at that other level, it's because it's me and not you, therefore you merit the ultimate. Unlimited. No negative side to whatever you do. Only positive return. The Midrash, David HaMelech, says, I'm concerned on the day of judgment, when I pass away, the sins of my heels, of my heel, will encircle me. And the Midrash goes to explain, this is what David said. We know David was one of a kind of a Jew. David Melchizel Chayvakayo, he was the most special Jew, the author of Psalms. After the patriarchs, David is rated as one of the most special people in the history of the Jewish nation. And David says, you know what, I'm concerned that a day of judgment, after I pass away, the sins of my heel will encircle me. Why? Because we read in Pirkei Ovos, it says you should be as careful with a minor mitzvah as a more severe mitzvah. Because you truly don't know the value of a mitzvah. That's what God says. And if that is the case, I'm concerned that maybe there's some minor mitzvah throughout my lifetime I neglect it. And if you neglect it, what does that say? That means as much as you believed, you didn't take out your yardstick to make that evaluation. So why did you fail on the lesser mitzvah and you always succeeded on the greater mitzvah? It must be, you know why? Because as much as you convince yourself you do it for the sake of God, but that that we find this level of discernment between more of this, less demands that confirms it was a self-interest. And once it's for the self-interest, then there's a claim against me. Because he's not supposed to do the mitzvah for yourself. He's supposed to do it selflessly for God. And that was David's concern. That's the sins of my heel, the sins that I trampled on with my heel, the minor mitzvahs, which I neglected, that will come to condemn me. That will be the pro my prosecution. So now it's interesting. Shabbos has great importance. Yom Kippur has great importance. Shema, if you fail, there's no corporal punishment. You don't eat the matzah, it's not the end of the world, the way we see it. You don't take the four species on sukkahs. You don't sit in the sukkah, these all positive commandments. Not the end of the world. You say, you speak out of turn, what we call Lashon Aram. Not the end of the world. But let's say you're careful. Even when other people seem to neglect and don't pay attention to the undervalue it, and you value it all. Why do you value it all? That despite the lack of gain, self-gain, you give it no less importance because it's the word of God. So it comes out of whole new understanding. We read in Pirkei Avos, you should be as careful with a, 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 a seemingly light mitzvah as a severe mitzvah. Because you don't know mitzvos. You don't know the extent of reward for mitzvos. You don't know. I'll give you an example. The way I always understood it. You have the Hope Diamond. And you have 100 trucks. Trailers loaded with iron. 
and you say to a person, what would you prefer? This diamond, and he doesn't know it's the old diamond, or 100 trucks, that each truck has a 40-ton capacity to hold steel. What would you prefer? The old diamond or that? Well, if you look at quantity versus quantity, you say, of course, the 100 trucks of each one holding 40 tons of steel rather than the diamond. But if you would know the innate value of that hope diamond, the value of those, the steel pales to the value of that diamond. So the way you explain it is this way. You should be as careful with the seemingly simple mitzvah as more advanced, more advanced mitzvah. Why? Because you don't know the extent of its reward, its innate value. You see it at a minimal level, it's really at a greater level. Therefore, address it and don't minimize it. So the way I was understood was this. Like a person says, I have a deal for you. Guaranteed $10 million return. Person, you know something? Within 24 hours, I only do $100 million deals. I don't do, do, do $10 million deals. Because it's that quick. The level of sense of accomplishment is not that great. You say to the person, you know something? I think you have to, you have, to have your head examined. You do enough $10 million deals Within a few days, you have the $100 million deal. You don't know the extent of, you're underestimating it. You think it's a small deal, that's a big deal. You should be as careful with a seemingly ordinary mitzvah because you don't extent, we're not saying the reward for a mitzvah kala for ordinary mitzvah is the same as Shabbos. It's not, it's not necessarily the same. But don't underestimate its value because the reward is phenomenal. It's unfathomable. Therefore, don't underestimate what that what the value is. That's how I always understood it. You don't know the extent of reward. It's just because it seems to be simple it doesn't mean to say you get you get the pittance on it. The return is phenomenal beyond your imagination. Therefore, go for it. Those are the words of Pirkeovos. You should be as careful with an ordinary mitzvah, a simple mitzvah, as a more extreme mitzvah. That's one one interpretation. The way we're explaining it now, it's a whole different understanding. Why does a person, why is he deserving of reward? As we say, the more difficult the challenge, the greater is the value of the accomplishment. Because it shows a greater level of dedication. As it says in Pirkei Elvis, Lefum Tzara Agro. Based on the sacrifice, the pain, that will determine the degree of reward. So let's say the average person sees this mitzvah as ordinary, unimportant, because it's it's a simple mitzvah that people don't pay attention to. It. So the way the evil inclination convinces everyone, it's not worth your while. It's not that important. And you, you focus on saying, what are you talking about? But if it's the will of God, you're looking at the wrong side of the, the, the coin. They're all the same. So despite seeing it wrongly, you see it rightly. So even though it's a mitzvah kala, it doesn't have the innate value of Shabbos, but because you meet a challenge that most people fail and you see it right, it's not the mitzvah kala, the innate value of the mitzvah, it's the challenge being a different type of challenge and you succeeded, that's why it has greater reward. Not because of its innateness, but rather the way you processed it, that you saw it right, which most people don't see it correctly. That's the understanding you should be as careful with the Simple mitzvah, because you don't know the extent. If you are, its value may be the equivalent of the greater mitzvah, because the main mitzvah you do naturally, because you see it clearly because of its severity. This, most people don't see it right. And you saw it right. That's special. Lahavdil, just to tell you a story. Many years ago, there was a book that came out. I read it maybe 45 years ago. Last time I saw the book. And it was called the Silver Era, S L S Silver S I L V E R Era. It was written. It was published by Feldheim. It was written by a person by the name of Rothkop. That was his name, an American. And it's about a rabbi. His name was Rabbi Eliezer Silver. About his life when he came to the United States. He was a rabbi in in Springfield, Pennsylvania. And eventually he was in Harrisburg, and then he went to Cincinnati. Last 50 years of his life, he was in Cincinnati. He was the chief rabbi of Cincinnati. 
and he was a person that was a genius, a great Torah sage, authored many books on the Talmud. And during World War II, he was involved in the Varat Sov, that was the organization that saved Jews, raised money to save Jews from the inferno of the Holocaust. Raised money to save Jews, to bribe Nazis, to buy Jewish lives. He was very involved. After the war, because he was involved, he was given a uniform. He was a, a little man. Could have been more than five foot five, maybe less. And he was given a, a uniform that didn't even fit him right. And it, the uniform had an insignia on it of a brigadier general, American general. And he went into the DP camps, the displacement per, uh, person camps, which were set up by the United States government and the British government for the survivors of the Holocaust to give these people some level of comfort, to console them. They lost their families, they lost everything, and the people without communities, and to assure them that the, the people concerned about them, they can be provided with food and, and lodging and clothing and all the Jewish articles, everything. And he went into the camps, and who does he meet? He meets a person, and he he looks at him, and the person doesn't want to look at him because he sees he's a rabbi. Although he's wearing a, a uniform, American officer's uniform, doesn't want to look at him. And this his name was Wiesenthal, the Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles. This was Wiesenthal. He was the Nazi hunter after the war. And he doesn't want to look at him. And he was a genius, this rabbi he, 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 Silvers. He goes over and he says, I see uh, for some reason you have so much angst against religion. You look at me with this very negative look. What, what's, what's, the, what's the problem? He says, I got a big problem. I have a big problem with Judaism. This is Simon Wiesenthal. He says, what's your problem? He says, you know, I was in the camp and I see people lining up in the camp, despite the fact that they don't know if they can be alive in the next hour, the next day. And they're lining up to use a sitter to pray. And he says, I thought that was very impressive. One person had a sitter and he was letting people use the sitter to pray in the camp. But then I realized, I got closer and I realized that this Jew who is allowing sin to be used, the people had to pay the bread of their ration for the day, which was survival. We would only let them use the sin if they'd give their ration to the use of the sitter. When I saw that, the day turned black. I said, a man who's so heartless and cruel that he charges the morsel of bread to take it out of their mouths for the usage of that sitter, I want nothing to do with Judaism if that's what it's about. And he says, I was appalled by it. I was nauseated by it. I want nothing to do with Judaism or God. So this rabbi says to him, he says, I want to explain you something. There's another way to see it, not the way you see it. It's true, the man who sold the city for their daily rations is a bad man, heartless man. But what about the Jews who are willing to give up their ration for the sitter, what does it say about them? They're special Jews. Praying was, was the equivalent of their lives. So instead of looking at the man selling the use of the sitter, look at the people who were willing to pay for that sitter. All of a sudden, his eyes lit up. He saw it, he was locked into that little tunnel vision. All of a sudden, a whole horizon opens up. He says, you're right, 100%. I saw it wrongly. Lahabdil. It's an ordinary mitzvah. What could its value be? Besides not knowing the extent of it, the comparison I said, the hope time versus the 40 trail loads of steel, of iron. But what about the fact that you could minimize it and you don't see it in a minimal level? Despite everybody seeing it wrongly, you see it rightly because it's the word of God. That added value is even more than a mitzvah, than a more severe mitzvah. 
because you see it differently than everyone else. You don't look at the innateness of the mitzvah, but you look at the one who commanded you to the mitzvah. And because you see it right, therefore you're deserving of even greater reward, even in a mitzvah, which is a mitzvah murah. Because a mitzvah, which is more severe, you do it because of its severity. Because you see the liability is greater. But here, well, you don't have that level of liability. Why are you doing it? Why are you committed? You know, why? What's well, the word of God? As a result of that, you're over the top because of that. That's the understanding. Therefore, if you even address the simple mitzvahs, which the average person tramples on with his heel, which this total neglect, and you give it its fullest attention, and you give it its value, you will merit, I will uphold the covenant for you, the chesed for you, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your herds and, and, and flocks, the produce, everything will thrive at a special level. Because when you connect to God on that level, it's always beyond unfathomable return. That's what the Torah is saying over here. So over here, the Balaturim, he says the word Akev, if you rearrange the letters, it spells the word Keva. So I wanted to say, this is very important. We know there are different categories of the Torah. There's what we call statutes, which are called chukim, mishpat about rational laws, and we speak about testament. Testaments. Rational laws don't steal, don't damage, don't insult, don't mislead another person, don't do, to be duplicitous, okay? These are rational laws. We speak about, what does it say that if you even pay attention to the rational laws, which other people neglect? What about laws which are statutes? Why is he focusing on nishpatim, on laws which are rational laws, laws that you understand? This is very interesting. You say to a Jew, why don't you steal? You say it's unethical. Why don't you kill? It's immoral. Why does the Jew steal? Is that why we don't steal? That's not why we don't steal. Of course, it's unethical, it's immoral. That's not the reason. The reason why we don't steal, it's true. Based on our feelings, our intellect, our emotions, we understand it's the wrong thing. But in its innateness, why is it wrong? You know why it's wrong? Because God says you're not permitted to steal. That's first and foremost. That's why. That's why. And why aren't you permitted to murder? Because God says you're not permitted to take a life. But it's, it's cruelty. That's not the reason why you're not permitted to do it. We're talking about the prohibition. What will hold you back and why you're not attracted to that because you're an ethical, moral person. But why are you not permitted to do it? What's the negativity and the basis for the liability? Because God says it's something which carries the death penalty because it's an act of evil. So it's evil because God said so. So if even the mishpatim, even the rational laws, why don't I do it? It's not because society says you're not permitted to do it. It doesn't meet society's standard of what ethics and morals are. That's not the reason. It's because it's God's dictate. Other people say, you know, if you get away with it, you do it. Right? We say a law on the books means nothing unless it's enforced. So why are you doing Because society dictates. So, but if society doesn't rein in on the people to uphold the law, they're not keeping it. But if you're doing because I don't steal because God said you're not permitted to steal. It's unrelated to incarceration. It's unrelated to being prosecuted. I don't do because God says you're not permitted to steal, you're not permitted to damage, and not permitted to embarrass another person or to hurt another person. In fact, that's unrelated to society. If you do at that level, even something which is emotionally fitting, that you can process it within the emotional intellectual capacity, but that's not the reason why you do it. That's special. 
That means you're, you, you soar, you should head and shoulders above all humanity. Because you know, anything which is ethical, moral, it could change like, as the wind changes, this could change too. No, there's an expression. Public opinion turns on a dime, on a dime. One day it's this way, tomorrow, how could it be? Yesterday it was just the, it was, it was the populist position. Today, you're in the door caps. What happened? It was so wrong, it was so right. Of course, nothing is etched in stone. But it's rooted in the will of God. Because God said you're not permitted to steal. It has nothing with what society says. It's okay. It's encouraged. Nothing to do with it. That's what other people, the way they see it differently, and you don't see it the way they do, is because it's God's dictate. Because the Torah is immutable. As it says in the, in the 13 tenets of Jewish belief, the Torah that was given at Sinai, which is divine, will never change. It's immutable. It's immutable because it's divine. If that's why you do it, your head and shoulders about, above all humanity. It has nothing to ethics and morals. So we speak about these people who say, the Jews are a light unto the nations. We're, we're the moral conscience of humanity. Bunch of nonsense. That's not what it's about. The light on the nations is that if we live according to the precepts of the Torah, we generate a holiness to the world where people say, you know, we get it now. The Jews are behaving in an exemplary way, refined in a special way. This is, these are real role models. It has nothing to do with the ethics, the morals, it has to do with the totality of the person. They behave like princes, if we would. That will be a light onto the nations. Ethical and moral, but why are we ethical and moral? Because it's the right thing to be because you can't have a society without it. That's not why. It's because it's rooted in our belief, which is rooted in divinity, which, which is immutable. And that's why in Ek of Tishmon, there's no pick and choosing. There's no human yardstick which makes this evaluation, but rather God is the determining factor. You trace it to its origin. And if you do that, you merit God will uphold the covenant, the chesed, blessing, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your flocks, the herds, and so on and whatever else that follows. So the word akev and keva is the same same letters. We read in Pirkei Ase Toroso Keva Malach Chayrai. Your Torah should be primary. That's the meaning of the word Keva. So it's switching the words. The same letters. Your work should be secondary. What does that mean? You know, you say to two people, "Do you live to eat, or you do do you li- do you live to eat, or you eat to live?" It's the same action. What, what's, where's, where's the emphasis? Do I eat to be able to live or do I live to be able to eat? Why do I earn? Why am I involved in the material arena of existence? Is it to facilitate my spirituality? Or is it no? I happen to have spirituality, but the sector of which is material to separate sector, that's primary. Or no, its value is only to facilitate the spiritual. That's Asay Torah Keva. Your Torah should be primary, everything else is secondary, only to accommodate and facilitate the spiritual. If that is your focus, even the material becomes spiritual. And then you have a level of clarity. If you have that level of clarity, then you do it for the right reason, not for the wrong reason. It's not for the self-interest, then you do it more selflessly, and you do it for the sake of God, then that's when you really merit the true bracha, because then the materials only to facilitate the spiritual, not to, to accommodate and facilitate your own interests and wishes. Not for that.
It's a beautiful midrash. It explains with an allegory. I'm going to end with this, that there was a king who wanted to have a garden and an orchard planted. And he gets the best horticulturists, planters to plant the fruit trees, the flowers, the shrubs, all of, to create the best garden in the world. And the employees, the people who he employs, he doesn't tell them, tell them what fee they're going to receive for planting which tree and which shrub or which flower. Why? Of course, if he would reveal to them the payment for each one, what do you, what, which one do you think they're going to plant? Let's say the olive tree or the, or the, the vineyard would have the greatest value. Everybody's putting the efforts in the vineyard or in the olive grove. All the other species of fruit trees he wants, nobody's attending them. So what does the king do? He says, you just do. At the end of the day, you come for payment. So they have, and he gives a list of what he wants done. So everybody goes where he wants to go, not knowing what the actual payment would be. Because if he would reveal the payment initially, everybody's putting their eggs in one basket. They're not going to attend to all the other things which are needed. At the end of the day, then people come and they get their due payment. So Midget says, if God would reveal the true value and payment for a mitzvah, what do you think people are going to do? We have 248 commandments that have to be addressed. So if one has the greatest degree of reward, all the others are going to be neglected. So what does God say? I don't reveal what your reward is. You're not aware. He explains it this way, one of the commentators. Let's say when you do a mitzvah, the day you put on tefillin, that day you buy a lottery ticket, you win the hundred, you win, win the billion dollar lottery. You'd say maybe it's a fluke. Next day, you give charity, you win the two billion dollar lottery. Eventually, it becomes obvious the reason why you're getting all these successes is because you're doing mitzvahs. You tell me who's not going to do a mitzvah. You see, it's an unbelievable investment. You do the mitzvah, the blessing flows. You can't even hold it back. Do you know what God does? No reward will reward this world. World rewards in the world to come. Because they be reward in this world, everybody's running after two mitzvahs for your self-interest. And which ones? The ones that generate the greatest return. God says, you know, you just put on those film every day to put on the tefillin. What, what's the reward? God will pay you your due reward. But what is it? It's a secret because God wants you to be the greatest beneficiary of doing that mitzvah because not knowing it and you do it despite that and you believe and you have faith, ultimately you will be rewarded. That brings that mitzvah to another level because the, the draw to the mitzvah is not my immediate benefit, which, would, which is obvious. Rather, you know, sometimes you have to wait 120 years to understand what the value of that is. And as a result of that, God is only concealing it that it should be in our best interest that we should maximize on the value of the involvement of doing the mitzvah. That's why God doesn't divulge and reveal to us what the innate value of anything is. And it's in a mitzvah. So you don't know the extent. And I don't want you to know what that is. It's something phenomenal. But you don't want to know something. Seeing is believing. If the payoff is to any degree in this world, that's reality. World to come, that's all abstract. We don't know exactly what that is, although we believe it. But it's not the same like winning the billion dollar lottery and you can write any check and you can support any cause you want and satisfy any need you want or provide for anything you want. It's not the same. The evil God says no. You're not willing, winning the billion dollar lottery because you put on Tefillin, although Tefillin is worth more than the billion dollar lottery. Because if that were the case, I'm taking away from you all the opportunity to do it at that special level because now you're doing selfishly, not selflessly. And that's the reason why that's the akif. You're doing it because it's the word of God rather than the self-interest that you should be so-called the winner to get the gold medal.